Okay, I'll put you on speakerphone and then you can ask me the questions. Thank you. Is democracy a failure and is there any better alternative? I see. Well, here's the thing. Democracy has not failed, but we have failed democracy. Uh, let me explain this in my rather limited way. <clears throat> There is a false perception by most people who are not properly acquainted with the real meaning and definition of real democracy that somehow democracy is, is about one group, uh, a majority supposedly, um, winning votes, uh, winning elections and getting their way over another group or other groups, in effect the minorities supposedly. Um, this perception of democracy as being sort of like a pendulum between one power and another over every few years, every some years, four years in America, etc. Actually, two years, because if you consider the midterms, that's a major uh, factor. This perception is wrong. Democracy is not about a majority having the right to be in power at the expense of the minority. Um, it's not about the majority imposing their will by means of so-called democracy. That's not democracy. And indeed, that's what we have come to in much of the so-called democratic world. We've come to a point where Democracies have not adapted to the changes, to the times, to the evolution of human societies and uh, have not adapted to the globalization that has taken place and which, by the way, is inevitable. I say inevitable because globalization is not something one can really stop. But, of course, one can and should try to make globalization a good thing rather than a negative thing. So, getting back to democracy, when people say that they think democracy does not work and that anarchy, social anarchy, whatever, is the solution, it's not usually because they really know what democracy is about and because they really also know whether or not anarchy is possible. In some of my videos, I have explained why I think anarchy is not possible and why it is actually dangerous to try to achieve it because, well, not only can it cannot, cannot be achieved, but because um, it just can't work. The, the, the very thing that we need most in between people is trust. And um, without some degree of um, democratic hierarchy that also has to include some degree of the best elements of anarchy by the way without a mix of the best elements of anarchy and the necessary elements of hierarchy in a democratic in a truly democratic way um, definitely we are all in danger I'm not going to want to go right now into the uh, whole thing about why anarchy is not possible and what the dangers of it would be if it was tried because as I say it's just not possible so even speculating on what would happen if it was ever so-called achieved it, it cannot be it, and, 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 and if any attempts have always led to an excuse for opportunists to simply take over and impose some form of hegemony some form of dictatorship some form of oligarchy whatever again democracy Democracy has to, if it's real democracy, has to do everything possible, really possible, to ensure that those who are not in elected office, those who are not in power, those who are not represented in elected office, are not somehow then um, endangered, that their rights to freedom of expression, free speech, which include their rights to life and their rights to freedom and their rights to safety and security and the basic essentials 
material essentials necessary to be able to participate in a democracy. I mean, how can you participate in a real democracy? Well, how could it be a real democracy if you cannot participate in, in it because you, let's say, lack the means to communicate with other people. Uh, you lack the means to safely express yourself um, and your ideas. You lack the means to get sufficient publicity to your ideas so that the rest of the world can become well informed about your ideas or the ideas that you vote for can become um, communicated to the masses. So obviously for democracy to really be real democracy, to work, you have to have certain basics guaranteed for those who are not um, in positions of power, who have not won the more recent elections. Otherwise, they can never um, uh, hope to achieve real power in a democratic and peaceful way. And of course, democracy implies a peaceful transition of power. So... In a sense, for democracy to really exist, it means that the majority cannot really have its full way. It cannot do all it wants. That's why we have what we call a constitution, or that's why we should have, and we should abide by, because it's not enough to just have, obviously, it's not enough to have the constitution in a theoretical written form. It has to be seriously applied and properly applied and, and properly protected and, and enforced. And that's, that means a constitution that ensures that the basic rights and needs, including material needs, to live health, relatively healthy, uh, meaningful lives, to be able to participate in democracy. Because if you're poor and homeless, you're disenfranchised. Your ability to participate in society in a democratic way is, uh, if not limited, it is totally uh, destroyed. Um, so... That's one thing. And another thing you have to also have in a democracy, insurances that the people who are elected into office, who are supposed to represent the majority, do not abuse that power even on the majority, and definitely not on the minority. So democracy is, 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 a, is not the s simplistic concept of, well, we won the elections, now we get to do what we want. That's what a lot of, uh, you know, pseudo-democracies or or even um, dictatorships that claim to be democratic uh, like to think. You know, I could give you some examples of certain countries, especially certain countries that have tremendous influence in their own regions, who have vied interest in, let's say, oil. And uh, they, they talk about how within their own culture and religion they are democratic. Whoopie-doo. No, they're not. Um... That's not democracy if you have uh, any form of theocracy. Um, if you are, if you know, if you're limiting any minority in any way from freely and safely expressing themselves. Now, let's let's also be clear about something. When I speak of legitimate minorities, I'm not talking about uh, any fringe groups that want to abuse minors. Um, you know, hurt people violently, threaten people with violence extreme left-wing and extreme right-wing uh, groups that are, in a sense, not really left-wing and are not necessarily right-wing, are not um, democratic groups. They're not, they're not legitimate in a democratic uh, society, in a democratic form of government. To have a democracy, you also have to have insurances against extremes. But herein lies the problem. Uh, if you take the United States of America, for example, where I was born, and uh, actually I was born in Washington, D.C., which I always like to point out because I've also lived there much of my adult life, and I consider it a very important experience to see democracy up front, or at least to see what is supposed to be democracy up front, and, and to understand that the theory is generally fine, uh, the practice is not. The United States is is no longer um, functional as a true democracy in every sense of the word. It's dysfunctional. And what it has made me realize is that what the founders of the United States, the founding fathers as they call them, although I think that's a rather 
um, chauvinistic term founding fathers. I like to just say the founders because they were also women involved. And obviously the women behind those men. So the founders of the United States, uh, when they established the United States and, 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 and created the initial form of the Constitution and set up a democracy of sorts, life was obviously so much different than it is today in those days. Uh, there were so many social factors that were so different. And it was m in some ways much easier to define uh, a working democracy, relatively speaking. Of course, one can argue um, the issue of universal suffrage and the failure to respect the human rights of, for example, black people who were enslaved or uh, if not enslaved, they were um, pretty much disenfranchised entirely. Um, those um, issues, regardless of those issues, um, were in theory being addressed in the initial stages of the early development of the United States. There were attempts to, um, in other words, make a more perfect union. But they were jettisoned or abandoned over time until much later. And I don't want to get into the whole complexity of the history of the United States and uh, all that because it's anybody can read it, uh, read about it for themselves. What I do think is important to understand is that democracy in the United States, um, f within a certain context, could work more or less uh, in a in a relatively um, you know purposeful, optimal manner um, relative to its purpose at that time because things were much simpler. But we have reached the point where we should have already realized, even at the very beginning, that there is a fundamental extra thing that is required for democracy to work. And that's something that I have um, pretty much expounded upon. I have this great idea of how for democracy to work in the United States, for example, you would need to have to separate to some extent on a regional level um, liberals and conservatives, in other words, city mice and country mice. I, I, I use the term city mice and country mice not to be offensive towards people, but because there's that famous story of the city mouse and the country mouse. And the allegory um, is quite correct. The city mice tend to be liberal and tolerant of differences and tend to be um, more accepting of otherness. Whereas the country mice, with some exceptions, tend to be the opposite. They tend to be intolerant of differences and otherness. They tend to want to be uh, united on some very simple principles that they consider correct, whether they are or not is another issue. And that stems from the uh, agrarian nature and the rural nature and the pastoral nature, whatever, the countryside, the wilderness, the, the independence, the rugged in individualism of you know, wilderness and the countryside and living outside of major cities, with some exceptions. So for, for democracy to be restored entirely in the United States, I realize that what we need to do is separate the country mice from the city mice and let them have each their own um, democracies. So it's not about how we would, you know, in a sense, create um, two separate Americas that would be at odds with each other. We'd still keep some kind of a federal um, United States of America. But within that United States of America, there would be the conservative states and the liberal states. And the liberal states would go towards Ten tendency wise towards the coast right most of the coast and the big cities that are on those coasts and also on the lakeside in Chicago so the states with the big cities next to the waters for example tend to be liberal at least predominantly so tend to be there are exceptions maybe you know if you go in the southern states so I would say that if the United States wants to be able to restore democracy and, and, and not be living a contradiction in terms and be dysfunctional as it is now, we need to have two separate 
like Switzerland, two separate cantons or two separate regions, the liberal and the conservative. Rather than this idea that every four years or every eight years uh, or every two years, we have a change in politics and then suddenly the conservatives come rushing into town, into the cities and start imposing their backwards ways on, on progressive liberals or the other way around that they should feel that their lives are being impinged upon, their right to, to be conservative, to have certain so-called family values, they call it, whatever. Um, we all know that that's, of course, nonsense because city people have a sense of family values and um, LGBTQA people, um, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, also have family values. Um, not all. Not all heteros and not all non-heteros have uh, a sense of family values or a sense of respect for the human rights of uh, especially vulnerable people, including minors and other vulnerable people. So, again, we need to separate, but not divorce, separate. And what would happen then is you would be voting for, electing uh, for representatives, officials, for your own type of general mindset except that there would be differences in specific policies. So within the conservative areas of the United States or in that, in that um, of the two Americas that would be still one America on a federal level, on the regional, local level, they would be able to vote for their own uh, differences of conservative candidates without uh, threatening the liberal city uh, mice. So the country mice and the city mice would just go on their own merry ways and live different types of lives. And that would be the perfect solution for the United States of America. And for that matter, it should be applied everywhere else in the world. I mean, can you imagine Afghanistan with, uh, you know, a backwards conservative Taliban section of the sections of the country and a, a progressive, uh, relatively liberal uh, alternative? Uh, and then they're both within a federal um, agreement so that their national, uh, international um, in, in needs are um, cooperatively arranged between the two internal cantons because you know Switzerland has cantons and they're very different in their profiles you know within Switzerland you have in a sense you have various little countries but they still are on a federal level one country and that's what the United States needs to do and that's what every country in the world should do rather than have to fear every now and then or for for indefinite periods of times that a certain mindset of a certain people is going to impose their way of life on you you would have that option of choosing which part of the uh, greater um, country you'd live in so if somebody's born in in a conservative part of the United States and they would decide that they don't want to live there anymore, they could move to the liberal without any risk of uh, harm or anything, and vice versa. If somebody's in a city and they've, well, for whatever reasons, decided that they no longer value <laughs> progressive liberal um, freedom and they want to have the you know, seemingly logical restrictions of the conservative way of life, they could move out to where the country mice are. And that's what I'm saying, separation within unity and unity uh, with separation. Uh, you know, when people separate, they don't divorce, right? They still may be friends uh, on some level. And how that would work in specific details about, you know, how would there be a bicameral uh, super presidency, two separate pre presidents who would then work together with a, possibly a third individual who would be sort of like the all-encompassing of the two, and then the three of them would work together to deal with international relations and trade and so forth and commerce and how the conservative states, um, conservative areas of the country would would operate their businesses and, and, and their transactions with the liberal states and with the world, etc. And, and, and agreements on access to ports, you know, trade. All these issues can be resolved. But I am convinced at this point in my life and in my understanding that democracy cannot work the way it has been tried so far because there is this fundamental and, as I see it, um, a factor that cannot be changed over any you know short-term period of time, even in the near future. There is this factor of a major difference 
in worldviews between those who are uh, country mice and those who are city mice, between liberals and conservatives. Now, um, one could argue, well, wait, if you're going to create two separate cantons, why not create a third one for people who are quasi-liberal, quasi-conservative? Well, I mean, that goes a little too far, I think. There's no need for that because, you know, let's say you are somebody who has some conservative values and some liberal values. You still have, in my opinion, within the liberal society, uh, an ability to function and live. Um, but the chances of somebody having a mix of those two values to the extent that it would become impossible for them to have fulfilling, meaningful lives in either of the two cantons, in either the liberal or the conservative side, is very small. It's irrelevant. Uh, I think people tend to either be more conservative or more liberal. Now, one can also argue, what if, the let's say, at some point, the majority of the conservatives, the majority who had, who had been living in their own canton, in their own mice, uh, uh, country mice part of the country, suddenly changed and decided to become city liberals, progressives? What if they decide to change? Could they suddenly just move into all the coastal states and abandon the rural agrarian states, and what would that do to those economies and those farms and whatnot, etc.? Well, the answer is simple. It's not likely to happen, but as I see it, we already have this separation anyway, except that it's not in, in a very honest way. And again, there's this leaking between the two types of way of life, the, the country mice and the city mice overlapping each other in very unhealthy ways. So I don't think that that would develop that way. But let's say it did. Well, no. Then the states that were conservative, once they become majority liberal, would turn liberal. And then they would join that canton, that grouping of the liberal states, and vice versa. So that's how it would work. But basically, when the elections came up for the presidents of either of the two cantons, this would not be a psychological or even a physical threat to the people who would then otherwise lose the elections. So in the United States, for example, right now we have what? We have the current upcoming uh, November elections between Obama and what appears to be Mitt Romney. And President Obama, relatively speaking, represents the uh, progressive liberal side, although relatively speaking. And um, Mitt Romney certainly doesn't represent anything near uh, to being truly liberal. And he is quite, in the eyes of most people in the uh, liberal camp, he's quite a fret, a very scary idea of having him as president. And I think this is uh, a tremendous uh, expense. Um, it's, it, it's, it's causing tremendous damage. It's very costly to the United States society and economy. You know, I have another thing about democracy. For democracies to work, there has to be a sincere effort on the part of government to truly appreciate the rights of individuals, especially uh, uh, to concern themselves with how to ensure that those individuals, either by their own means or with some assistance from the government, can be happy. Because the happy factor is the most important thing that is now missing in much of Western society's economies. People are not happy. And one of the reasons is because of the after effect of the beginning of the era of AIDS, for example, and how it totally devastated certain liberal ways of living that made adults in the liberal communities in the city mice ways of life made their lives miserable because now there was this terrible fret and there was this hyping of it. And it actually is a fret, but the fact of the matter is that we all know that um, sex should not be the victim or sexual freedom should not be the victim of diseases that are dangerous and that we can do something to prevent. And uh, the problem, however, is that um, policies, on, especially on the part of the country mice on top of the lives of the city mice, bad policies, made people unhappy. So Americans in general are unhappy. The conservative country mice are unhappy because they can't uh, 
uh, get rid of the liberal um, family damaging, as they see it, way of life. They see that liberals as being uh, a threat to humanity and the survival of the species and all that nonsense. And the other side, right, rightly so, feels that these backwards conservative uh, country mice are a threat to their right to live freely. And when people are not uh, free to be and live as they want, and when there are no venues, when there are no places for uh, lower middle class, lowered middle class, that's another category, lower middle class and lowered middle class, new poor and the traditional poor, when the people in the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, class of society are not happy, then they certainly are not as functional and they can't work as well. And they're not healthy either. Because when you're happy, you tend to be healthy. Your immune system works better when you're happy than when you're not. In fact, there's plenty of evidence that people who are depressed, unhappy, overstressed, and have nowhere to release that stress, no way to release that stress, become dysfunctional and uh, and are, uh, are basically unable uh, to maintain their health and Therefore, they're they're I mean they're they're caused health problems, and this is causing a damage to the economy. So I say the happy factor is missing, and I could easily advise major governments in the West on how to restore their economies almost overnight, if they'd only understand the importance of the happy factor. You know, in the case of, for example, where I live now in the UK, if um, and this happens to be a predominantly city mice culture. Um, although there is a significant uh, aspect of the country mice here too. But the city mice in general are not happy anymore. They have no venues to, that they can afford to go to to enjoy their lives as adults, between consenting adults, right? I don't want to get into the details about what that means, but basically when adults are happy and if they're parents, then their children notice that their parents are happy. And when people are happy, then, and when their parents are happy, then the children tend to be happy, and that's all the better. So we have a very sick, dysfunctional, modern way of life in most of the Western world because of this imposition of ways of life on the part of country mice over city mice and vice versa, because of the failure of governments to be concerned about providing suitable venues for people to enjoy their lives, release their stress, because of the over-commercialization, everything's become about money. You know, once once you turn everything into big business and money and everything's attached to money, then you get rid of the happy factor. And that actually is counterproductive and backfires and damages the economy. So I say one of the most important things that can be done is to provide these alternative venues. And the same would apply in the conservative country mice way of life. If country mice poor, because among the country mice there are also poor, if they had certain venues, not necessarily the same as the city mice, but if they had their certain types of venues provided for by their local regional governments, then they would be happier. And that might include, um, well, for conservatives, it might include going to shooting ranges and all that crap. I don't want to get into the details, but let's just put it this way. When people are happy, they are more um, functional and they're healthier and they're more productive and they are able to work better and the economy improves. It's as simple as that. Um, there's a, just too much fear in Western societies of all the threats to our way of life, our democracy. We, we've come to the point where because of the contradictions inherent in the various giant uh, corporate complexes that run our lives because of the inherent dysfunctionality of this clash between the corporate and the in, the private uh, individual, between the public and the corporate. There's a clash. Uh, we have because of this we have another problem, and that again goes back to the idea that everything is now about money. And if you want to have fun in a city, it's so expensive to go downtown and have fun if you're poor. You, it's so expensive to go to a club. And people can argue, well, some of the big cities in the West have free museums or at least relatively free museums and all that stuff. Fine. But, you know, there's more to life than just going to a museum and learning about things. I think it's very important. And, and unfortunately, now with the global economic crisis and the downturn in uh, the availability of government money, 
which cannot be solved by just uh, harsh austerity measures. This whole concept, by the way, and this all ties into the rest of the issue of democracy. This whole concept of you know downsizing governments and um, austerity measures as a means to make countries more attractive to private investors worldwide as well as nationally to to entice the rich to invest in countries and governments and societies that are austere that's insane to destroy unions and the working the rights of the working class is counterproductive but people can argue no we don't know we no longer need unions and the rights of workers because we have the new technologies with which to control them it's a big mistake. It, 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 will, it will backfire. It won't work. There's just too many reasons why it won't work, and I'm not going to get into that right now. So does that answer your question about democracy? Because as I see it, we really need separation of uh, city mice and country mice. So basically what you're saying is that it's not that democracy has failed. It's that we haven't adapted it to the modern times. Yes. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to say that if we want democracy, we have to rediscover what that means in the modern world. And maybe that should have been done already from the beginning. Maybe there should have been the separation of the country mice and the city mice, but still have some kind of umbrella federal government. So just like I said, similar to Switzerland. And, and that's basically what I like to say about democracy. It's, democracy has not failed. It is truly when it really works, it is truly the only logical way to have a relatively safe society uh, and, and a meaningful one. Otherwise, uh, we end up going in the direction of anarchy. But unfortunately, as I said, anarchy cannot work. Um, and it then degrades into, it breaks up into chaos. And this leads to uh, the most aggressive, the most violent, or the most empowered and dangerous people taking over more power and abusing the people. So democracy is really the only way forward, but it has to be real democracy. And again, you need ethics for that. That's, that's the one thing I should have emphasized here. All of this is about ethics. As a philosopher of ethics, is, that's what I am, I've thought about this for a long time. Separation of the country mice from the city mice, there's no option. That is the way. That is the only real way to solve the problem of the crisis of the failure of us to maintain democracy. So I am convinced that democracy is the only way, but it has to be real democracy. And real democracy does has to mean that every person has, for example, really has free housing. May not if it, if the government has to provide you housing, then it shouldn't be luxury sized housing. It shouldn't be even you know, uh, middle-sized housing. It should be small, compact, ultra-efficient, safe, and located near your workplace, by the way. So government should provide uh, free housing to those who cannot afford it. But of course, over time, it's best that the people who are in free housing, the majority of them who will actually want to do so, should save their money and eventually buy into private housing. And and, and, and that would be the best way to solve it. Um but public housing is essential in, in a democracy. There has to be the guarantee that if you are being abused by your employer and you haven't yet found a better job and you have to leave your job, that you're not going to end up homeless and that you're not going to end up hungry, hungry um, that you're not going to end up without the basic minimum of clothing and whatever else you need, uh, communications like telephone, etc. So, and television. So in a, in a democracy, you, government has a responsibility to make sure that the minority, the weak, the poor, the, the the people who would otherwise be disenfranchised and destitute, are guaranteed a minimum quality way of life. Um, and people would argue, wait a second, if that happened, people would just simply not want to work, and they say, well, I'm going to get it for free anyway. I don't agree. Getting minimal stuff from public, from through the through government, is not something most people would be happy to uh, you know declare and openly talk about and it's not something people like most people want to have their own money make their own money have their own jobs they want to have their dignity right so I don't buy into that uh, argument that if government provides the minimum of necessities for those who are suddenly in a crisis that those people will remain that way f in e eternally uh, 
When they have, it's because they were really not provided the actual minimum that they needed. In fact, when so-called welfare states have failed, it's because they really weren't welfare states. The provisions that were given, whether it was free housing or affordable housing, whatever you want to call it, they were not properly done. They were not done in the right way, uh, and sometimes deliberately so. Sometimes the, 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 the welfare systems were deliberately made to fail so that the, you know, the elites, the rich, can say, well, there you go. Uh, you can't have a functional welfare state, so you might as well forget it. No, you need to have a functional system within a government society, within a, within a democratic government society, that provides the minimum basics of, for all, of necessities for all citizens if they need it. But again, I argue that most people will not want to stay like that and will actually take advantage of the opportunity to save their earnings and go into back into the private sector and eventually hopefully stay there. That's the progressive way. There will there will be a minority, there will be a minority, an estimated 10-15% of society who would fail to want to become, you know, dignified in their self sufficiency. But that might be because they simply have health problems, mental health problems, and possibly physical health problems. Therefore, they are disabled. So, again, it's a very uh, false argument. And um, last but not least, as I said in the beginning, democracy also means that we have to have security. And part of having a secure democracy is uh, not having a capital punishment system, not having the death penalty. The death penalty is, a, is something that can be abused by corrupt politicians, by corrupt people in power uh, to, to destroy the democratic rights of the individuals. So I oppose that. I think we should understand that the price of dealing with serious, hardcore, proven, aggressive criminals, uh, real thugs, real dangerous people, uh, keeping them alive in isolation is really the best option because we can't risk the chance that we would send somebody to their death who turned out to be innocent. So I, I definitely am opposed to that. But when it comes to, for example, abortions, I think that has to be the woman's choice because also part of democracy is respecting the sovereignty of the individual, of the living individual. And the right of a free-living individual, of a woman in this case, to determine what she does, whether she keeps the baby or not, should be hers. I could also argue two things, that uh, a, 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 the yet unborn, uh, hopefully at an early stage in development, yet unborn person, if you want to call it that, zigot, whatever, <clears throat> uh, embryo, that yet unborn uh, living entity is still dependent on the mother and, and, and legal rights don't pertain to such the direct biological dependencies. Then we could argue about you know protecting the, the life of a, of a cancer's growth on your face or something. I mean that can get into absurdity, right? So it has to be a woman's choice. Um, and another thing is in, from just from the religious point of view, for those who argue, well, you could end up murdering the next Messiah, the next one who'll bring you know peace on earth. I think that's rubbish. If uh, there is such a God, and I, I think there is God, but not necessarily such a God, then it's not going to be uh, a problem to ensure that the one child that is not yet born, who will be the Messiah, or the Savior of the world, will be born, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a baloney argument. And, and overpopulation and demographic imbalances is a major problem for democracies. That is also something that would be better solved if we had this separation between the country mice and the city mice, and I would get into that in another conversation. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you for asking me the questions. Have I, have I really answered your question about democracy? Totally. Uh, really, it's been very interesting. Okay, thank you.